So let's start the year off right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I have eyes to see. I have, and I have ears to hear. I anticipate your revelation in my life. And we said that we were going to start talking about. I'm sorry, what now? I just added, I'm a doer, not a hearer. And I'm a doer, not a hearer. That's right. We were starting to talk about being a doer of the word today, being a doer and not just a hearer only. Amen. Amen. Now, um, but a little bit of. of, of of uh, intro into this because I, I want us to understand that, you know that passage is taken from James where he says you know and be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself but you know it, it's it's in a body of having said other things and I think it's important that we understand that before we go any actually go into it so uh, I wanted to tell you or, or make mention the fact that during the time that Paul and James and even you know earlier when Jesus was alive there was a great discrepancy, a great difference between the way that the Jews thought and the way that the, the Greeks thought. Um, the Greeks desired, above anything else, a pursuit of knowledge. Um, Jews desired, above anything else, to see God operating. So Jews sought for signs. Uh, Greeks sought after knowledge. And uh, you couldn't get a whole lot more diametrically opposed to one another. The way that they approached the Messiah, who was among them both, was from two different vantage points. And both of the vantage points wound up, uh, were in conflict with one another. The, 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 the Greeks wanted to understand God. They wanted to, in fact, the, the word that is used often for wisdom, a Greek word, for wisdom. In fact, I'll just say this, that the Greeks desired knowledge so much they had many, 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 many different words for knowledge. Uh, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, insight, perception, uh, so many different words to define different nuances of learning and uh, the apprehension of knowledge. And that's turned our advantage because the New Testament is written in their language, in the, in the language of the Greeks. And so uh, we, we learned quite a bit about what they were thinking. But also Paul used it, and James used those same words to give us greater understanding of, uh, of the pursuit of God, and especially knowledge of Him. But, you know, the, J the Jews wanted to see a display of God's power. Go ahead and turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 22. The Jews wanted to see a display of God's power. The Greek wanted God's knowledge, His wisdom, understanding, skill, insight. And, and by, by saying His, I mean... You know, the Greeks had many gods, didn't they? And they sought many different gods. And, you know, whenever I, Paul went in there and he started talking about the unknown god, that fell right into their, uh, their, their Bailey work, wick of things because they, they loved to sit in the marketplaces, the Romans, the Greeks, and listen to and debate philosophy and higher knowledge and higher learning and, and explain to us, you know, what you think the gods think and so on. It was all about the apprehension of knowledge, insight, uh, and, and so on. But And the Jews, of course, they saw that as just such an empty exercise because if there is no display of power, then you're just following nothing, right? And, you know, and really, in Christendom, we've got both Jews and Greeks. And I don't mean uh, uh, um, ethnically. I mean in the way that we approach God. You have people that live for a sign and those who only approach God through knowledge. And, uh, and both of them are, are right and both of them are wrong. You know what I'm saying? You have to have a merger of the two. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 22, and uh, I put that on the slide as well. Uh, thank you. We'll see if it will show up. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But what we do in response to both of them is we preach Jesus. In other words, we're not giving either one of them what they want. And yet, if they really have ears to hear and eyes to see, we're giving them both precisely what they need. Amen? He says, the Jews request a sign. Didn't we see that in Jesus' ministry? He could never do enough parlor tricks for these people, could he? No. 
You know, he fed 5,000, and the next day they're following him. And, you know, he's like, you know, I'm telling you, you're not following me because you saw the sign, meaning, in other words, the sign um, uh, had the impact it was intending to have, and that is to generate faith in your heart that I'm the Messiah. I'm telling you, you're following me for another sign. You want more food. And there, he said, you know, uh, you need to stop following after signs and, and pursue the real bread, so, so pursue the, the real work of God. And they're like, well, 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 tell us, what is the work of God? And he's like, well, that you might believe. This is the work of God, right? And uh, he said, you know, an evil generation seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it, except for the sign of Elijah, which, uh, um, uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry, uh, what was it? Of Jonah, yeah, of Jonah, which was, of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which would have met both, uh, both requirements. But here he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm wanting a sign, and instead I'm getting a stumbling block. I want information, I want wisdom, and what I hear from your lips is foolishness. But to those who are the called. Now the word called there actually is a very tricky word. In the Gospels it has a slightly different meaning than it does in the Epistles. And so um, if you don't know that, you're going to have some problems in understanding your New Testament. In the epistles, the word called is a completed act. It means those who have responded to the called. In other words, it could say the saved. Are you following? Mm -hmm. The word called itself just means invited. Okay, now remember Jesus talked about those who were called to the wedding feast. It means those who were invited, right? Mm -hmm. And that term is used throughout the New Testament. But in the Gospels, it's largely just talking about the invitation itself. But, um, and there's actually more nuances than that that I just don't can take time to get into. But in the epistles, largely the word called is talking about those who've responded to the call. Okay? So here he says, but to those who are saved, in other words, both Jews and Greeks, it makes no difference. Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's the sign and the understanding. Right? Yeah. You're seeking after a sign. Jesus is the sign of God's power. Right? You want understanding. Jesus is the understanding of God. Right? Yeah. The wisdom of God. But, you know, if you're coming at it from the perspective of a Jew or a Greek, in other words, intellectually and on the outside, he's going to be a stumbling block and foolishness to you. But, you know, to those who are saved, to those who have responded to the invitation, Jesus Christ is both the power and the wisdom of God. Now, uh, when we turn over uh, to, go ahead, if you turn if you want to, to uh, uh, James, the first chapter, the passage that we're looking at, in, John, in James uh, chapter 1, he tells us, and uh, I'll give you the exact verse here in a second, because I was actually, we're going to be looking at the whole passage, the passage as a whole today, uh, but the, the key verse that we're looking at is uh, in James 1, 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we're looking at doers of the word, not hearers only. What fundamental thing does that phrase right there, doers of the word, not hearers only, what fundamental thing does that communicate to you? What is that passage saying? Action required. Okay, an action is required. And an understanding of him. Spend time understanding what he wants, not what okay. we want, but what he wants. Okay, the key is that right there. The first fundamental truth of being doers of the word and not hearers only is that you have to have heard something. Mm -hmm. You have to have heard something. Primarily the right? truth. Well, and particularly, we're talking about hearing his voice, right? Yes. Hearing directly from God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds an ongoing action, right? Proceeds, in other words, was proceeding, is proceeding, and will continue to proceed out of the mouth of God. Man lives by this. Amen? Amen. So, you know, so in, in James here, in James 1.22, he says that 
Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. But in that word hearing, it's very, very important that you recognize you can't be doing something you have not heard. heard. It's very important to hear. That phrase right there, it's real easy to skip to the doing because we need to be doing. Amen? Yeah. Would you agree with me? Yeah. But before we do, we must hear. Before you take action, you slow down and you listen. Right? Yeah. That's so very important. What did Jesus do before he did anything during the day? Listen to he listened. He listened. He retreated to a quiet place to commune with his father. Hear what his father had to say. The father made investments in the son. Amen? Deposits of his influence over him. You know, not everything that God said to Jesus, in fact, many times what God said to Jesus was really not for what he was going to be teaching later. It was for Jesus. Yeah. For Jesus. Yeah. Jesus needed to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he's God. Yes. Yes, and he was man. Yeah. And as man, he needed to hear. Just like we do. Just like we do. Man, Jesus was a man, was he not? 100%. Yes. And so therefore, he could not live by bread alone. He required the voice of God or he could not live. And he was wise enough to know that and wise enough to take action accordingly. He, before he did anything, he heard. Amen? So, 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 so important. Very, 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 very important. Now, um, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Before you can do, you must hear. Before you can do, you must first hear. Now, I have a few points that are gonna, we're going to look at first before we actually delve into the passage. We're going to actually start in James 1.1. 1, 1. But I wanted to cover a few things. In Christian circles, we have dissected God's Word into bite-sized morsels, which can be easily digested. You know, and that's good, but it creates some problems. And one of the problems is we rarely know anything about the setting of a passage. Who was writing to who and why? I can pull up, I can quote a passage to you like, you know, um, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Christians love that one. Most of them have no idea what book it is and who said it, why he said it, under what conditions he said it. So really, you really don't even know what those words actually mean. I can make it mean anything I want. And for years, Christians have turned that into my joy. Me being happy is what makes me strong. But it doesn't say that. He didn't even say Jesus, God's joy in your heart. No. It has nothing to do with your heart at all. It's God's joy. God being joyful can be my strength. Amen. Are you following? Yeah. It had nothing to do with joy in your heart. It had to do with joy in His. But you see how if I quote that, what's the first thought the human mind goes to? My joy. God's joy in my heart. You know what I'm saying? And that's the way I took it for years. I don't know about you. But when I actually went back and read the passage, all of Israel was mourning. They were crying. They were weeping. And Jesus, God told me, said, you know what? Enough. I don't want to hear any more crying because today I'm happy. And so you, you rejoice. He didn't say you have joy in your heart. He said, act that way. Start having a party even though there's still tears running down your face because I'm joyful and my joy will be your strength. And infuse them with power and strength. Before the end of the feast, I would imagine it's easy to say that the passage does not reveal it, that people's hearts probably did receive a lot of joy, but didn't start that way. And their strength didn't come from the joy becoming their own, but by acting out of God's joy. Because there was power. There was power there. Yes. <clears throat> they did studies and it's been scientifically proven. That if you put on a smile, you will become happy. Yeah, that's true. They even did it with um, people that are like horribly disfigured. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were born that way, but their like mm -hmm. face looked like it blew up. Yeah. 
you know, so you can't see a smile even if they did smile. Yeah. But they told them to, you know, do whatever you feel like you need to do that makes you feel like you're smiling. And mm-hmm. by doing that, it took them from being, you know, very, you know, morbid and depressed and, depressed and hateful and uh, more of a happier mindset. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Because they they'd sit down and, and there's a group of them and they mm-hmm. tell them all to, you know, smile and, you know, be happy. <laughs> That's right. So, so you know, but you can see that as just an illustration that you can take a, a passage out of its context. And again, I understand that in Christendom, it, it's a, it, we've, we've made these little tiny nuggets that we grab a hold of, and not all of them are out of context. But because we have done that, we've divorced it from its setting so that we rarely know anything about the setting of the, fra- of the passage, who was writing it, and why. What was the point? So we often miss the point, right? Amen? That's very, very important, and that's important when we're looking at this being hearers of the word, uh, um, being doers of the word, not hearers only. If we don't understand who he was addressing, why he was addressing it, and, and what the point of the passage was, then we wind up missing the entire thing that God was trying to get across to us. Number two, we rarely know the actual point and message of the passage. What was the overall scope? Where, was they, where were they heading? Are you seeing what I'm saying? That when, a, when James sat down to start writing a letter, he had a goal in mind. He said, in his mind, he realized, this right here is what I need to communicate to them, right? And if you, if you just pull a single verse out of a context, you're missing most of that, aren't you? If not all of it, unless you're familiar with it. We rarely know the actual point and message of the passage. Uh, James, believe it or not, being doers of the word and not hearers only was not really the full intention of that letter. It was part of it, but really the greater truth was the result of that, which was Christ in you. That was the greater goal. But you don't get that if all you do is just see this. It turned, the phrase, be, uh, be doers of the word, not hearers only, can very, very easily turn it into a mechanical work, can't it? Exactly. Something, you know, well, I heard it. I don't make sure I, 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 that I, I make a checklist of things that I can make sure that what are, I remember uh, growing up that, you know, you did not preach a real sermon they teach you in college unless there's a call to action. Right, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to stir your flesh to put into practice a spiritual principle, right? Yes. Uh, so, so, uh, so what I do is I, I challenge you. Think of three ways that you can put into application what you've learned today. And oh, that's a good idea. And you write down these three different ways that I can, I can, I, 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 I can put into action what I've heard today, and I've turned it, I turn a spiritual thing into a work. Are you following? Now, now, am I saying that it's not a good idea to seek God's face and say, Father, how do I flesh this out? How do you live this through me? No, that's a good thing. But, but, if you, but for me to encourage you to come up with your own list and then work hard at making it happen so by the end of the week you can pack yourself on the shoulder and say, well, I learned that lesson. You haven't had experience with God at all. You've just done character reformation. You just went through a physical boot camp and altered your behavior without God. Well, that's just as bad as having not altered your behavior at all. Three, we often jump to conclusions about a passage. You can imagine why this is important when he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If you're not really hearing what he's saying, but you're jumping to conclusions about what he's saying, you're going to wind up way over here when God's here. You know what I mean? You know, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've had that happen in my life where the Lord said something to me, but I interpreted it for him. And I turned it into something he didn't actually say. Yeah. You know? It's like when people say that phrase about Jesus went and hung himself, and then they had to go do his <laughs> life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Best. You know, the Lord, uh, the Lord can tell you something. Like, you know, he told me years ago, I don't want you to go out and, and <coughs> be an employee underneath an employer. You know, don't seek employment. What I heard was, don't work. And I was terrified. I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't understand. And so uh, up to that point, all I'd ever done is work for other people. I was outside of my, my it was not even in my little box to work for myself. That had never even occurred to me. Never. 
And so, you know, I thought, well, that can't be right. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't need. I need to provide for my family. So I go to try to find employment, and every time I did, I sense death. Yeah. Don't do this. And I'm like, okay, I've got your word over here telling me if I don't do this, I'm bad, and yet I've got this thing over here telling me that if I go do it, I'm doing what's wrong. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. It took months before I realized that God said, I never told you don't work. <laughs> do those words ever come out of my mouth, Mark? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, don't seek employment. Oh. Oh! <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, we often jump to conclusions about passages. And we can jump to conclusions about God's spoken word. What he says to us, right? So, uh, you know, that's a dangerous thing. You know, God will, and God will often do this on purpose. He'll give you just enough light to bait you to come and fellowship with him. He doesn't give you everything at one moment. You know what I mean? He wants you to spend time with him about this. Commune with him. That's what that was. That was God did not give me marching instructions. He gave me an invitation to a conversation. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you to seek employment. That should have started a conversation. What it did was, was uh, because of my, my way as being human, I'm going to please you, God. You wait right there. I'm going to go get that done. I'm going to go out and not get employment. <laughs> You know, I'm going to try real hard, you know, and, you know, because I'm all about, I want to really make him happy. I really, I'm going to, I'll show you, uh, you're going to be so proud of me. Nobody could employ me. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, these stupid ideas we have, you know, about what God tells us to do. And really what that was, was just an invitation to have a conversation. Amen. To hear from our father. Amen. And really that's what scripture is to us. Four is we fail to learn the lessons Scripture teaches. Because of all this other stuff, we fail to learn. Right? If I just pull this one passage out, be a doer, not just a hearer, I'm going to miss the greater lesson that the Scripture's teaching. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Now, I hope you understand why I'm going through this instead of just diving into being a doer. Because if you don't know these things... You're going to do exactly what these things are telling you will be the result. You'll jump into something before you've actually heard it. You're going to be impetuous, and you're going to be, we're going to all be scraping you at the, uh, 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 off the sidewalk because you stumbled and you fell. You know what I mean? And this, God doesn't call us to fall, and he calls us to victory. Amen? Amen. To overcoming. But overcoming, I, I tell you, I, this past week it has come up a lot. A realization of how much God is not in a hurry. He He's not in a hurry. Yes. Everything with God takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, uh, we, we see a, a perfect illustration of, in a study of opposites, when we look at nutrition and medicine. Mm -hmm. Nutrition is not going to solve your problem right now. Right. It's going to take weeks, maybe months, perhaps years, years of eating the right way and doing the right thing before your body is whole. It's true, without question. Because it's a little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. God is not about, most of the time, is not about coming in and rushing and just changing because it's more about the journey than it is the destination. Are you following? And everything with God is that way. Everything with God is that way. Days are 24 hours. They're not 30 minutes, right? Weeks are seven days, right? Years are 365 days, and then God every once in a while throws in an extra day, right? I mean, time, 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 time. Seed, time, lots of time, harvest, right? I mean, it, it requires, and all of that teaches us things. The, the, the medical field, what it does is it goes in and extracts. It's so funny to me because they say herbs and stuff like that really don't do anything, and yet they, their medicines wouldn't exist if it weren't for herbs because they go to the herb to get the thing that works, extract the one thing that makes it work, concentrate it, synthesize it, and then shove it in your body. And now, of course, it's got tons of side effects because all the other things that were in that herb initially that made your body respond to it, now those things aren't there. You're just giving the solution without all the buffers, and so now your body's going to treat it like poison. So that now the thing that God made for your good is now for your bad. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that's the way we do things, you know, because we want it now. Are you following? And God's not all about now. He's all about a journey. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm grateful that because there are times where if you didn't have something now, you would die before you got to three months from now. I'm not saying God doesn't use it. I'm just trying to use it as a comparison between the way we like to live life and the way God actually teaches life to be lived. Amen? Amen. Things take time. We fail to learn the lessons that teach the scriptures teach. We fail to learn the lessons that, that uh, scriptures teach. The net result of all of this is that it dulls our perception of God's voice. The net result of all of those things, I'll read them to you again. We rarely know anything about the setting of a passage, who was writing to who and for what reason. We rarely know the actual point or message of a passage. We often jump to conclusions about a passage, and we fail to learn the lessons that Scripture is giving us in a passage. And the net result is it dulls our perception of God's voice because, you know, I'll give you an illustration. Uh, we, we used to do this in here. We would, we would pray for, uh, we would pray for um, a good report. I'm praying for a good report. I want everybody to be praying with me for a good report. Well, what's your scripture? Well, it's in Hebrews 11, and where it says that the elders obtain a good report. Well, actually, it doesn't say that. It says, by faith, the elders obtain a good report. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, great. So I want you guys to use faith that I'll get a good report. No, 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 no. That's not what the passage is talking about. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. And I'll pray and I'll pray and I'll pray. God, I'm going to go to the doctor. I want a good report. Well, you know, I misunderstand the passage. What did I just do? I didn't know anything about the setting of the passage, who was writing or why he was writing. I didn't understand the point of what he was trying to say. I jumped to a conclusion about it. I failed to learn a lesson and therefore made an assumption about God. And then you get I, I know nobody identifies with that at all. Oh, yes. And then you get disappointed. <laughs> and then we wind up getting disappointed. Yeah. Right? This doesn't work. Well, you're right, it doesn't work. God never said it would. God never said what you did. Right? You guys do understand what I'm saying. This is, this is a really bad epidemic in the body of Christ. It really is. We are the most uneducated about our own faith of anybody on the planet. We don't know what God says. We know things that he, we know things he said. We don't know what he said. We don't know the context he said it in. And all of this will wind up dulling our perception of God's voice. God will come and start to speak to you. And when he says something to you, because you have these, these, these little boxes that are filled with these little bite-sized nuggets of Scripture that are taken out of context, when God actually begins to say something to you, you're like, well, God would never say that because this box right over here says this. And this box over here says this. So I know God can't be speaking to me. What does it do? It's dulling your perception. You're not hearing him. You can't hear him because you've already you've already got it gridlocked as to what God and can God God can and cannot say what God can and cannot do. Yeah. And God's like, you know what? I, I will I, I will be new wine in your old wine skins, and I will blow out of your categories of perceiving me. Mm -hmm. I will not be contained. God will not be contained. Yeah, as soon as you think you've got him figured out, he'll go another direction. He'll always be good. He'll always be merciful. He'll always be kind. He'll always be good. I mean, uh, he'll be who he is. But, you know, he's not going to be stuck into a rut of your way of seeing him. God wants you to know who he is. He's an endless ocean, a bottomless sea. Amen? Yes. Endless ocean, bottomless sea. And don't, 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 don't get all caught up in your little, little tiny spot in the sea. There's lots of area out there to go swimming in, right? Now, um, so... It, the net result is it dulls our perception of God's voice. Now, in James, um, he addresses these things right here. Holy living, the role opposition plays in the process of holy living, the necessity of faith in God's word, which is wisdom, which is why he brings up wisdom at the very beginning. I know you guys don't want to write every one of these things down, so I'm going to have to sit here forever. Yeah. James addresses holy living, the role opposition plays in the process of holy living, the necessity of faith in God's word. I'll throw this up again later. That's these, how we miss the fear, wisdom. Fearing the, fearing the Lord in our choices and communing and partnering with God in his work of salvation. That is what he addresses in this letter. I'll go back over them again. Holy living, 
the role opposition plays in the process of holy living, the necessity of faith in God's word, fearing the Lord in our choices, and communing and partnering with God in his work of salvation. That is what James talks about and addresses in this letter. His letter is about Christ in you, though those words are never used even once. The whole letter is about Christ in you. It's a very practical letter of how to get from where you were as not being Christ-like to being Christ-like. And he goes all the way through everything, including the, the horrible tendencies towards sins that we do. In chapter 4, when he starts off, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that your friendship with the world is violently hostile against God? And he goes all the way through that part of our personality. He also, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, addresses how we have a tendency to judge people by externals and give preferences to people with money and show less preference to people who are poor and all these kind of things. He brings up all the dirty things and shows us how to work through it, how to be a doer of God's spoken word that you might become Christ-like. Are you following? So let's start at the very beginning in James, the first chapter, starting in verse 1. And we're not going to be in a major hurry. Uh, I want us to spend a little bit of time with it because, again, it, we want to make sure that we actually learn what James is saying to us. Amen? Because if we're going to be doers of the Word, this is a process. There's a way this works, and there's a lot of ways it doesn't work. You know, there's, there are literally countless ways to not get someplace. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. But there's very few ways to get where you need to be. Yes. You know? Now, when we're talking about getting into relationship with God, there's only one way, right? Now, when it comes to do with the character of Christ in us, there, there's, a, there's actually really only one way with that as well, but it can be manifest all kinds of ways, can't it? Yeah. But there's tons of things I can do and not get there. That's for sure. And I want to be very deliberate about Christ in me. Amen? Yeah. So in James chapter 1, starting in verse 1, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings! Hello! Hello! My brethren, count it all joy. Consider it. Think about it this way. Count it relational excitement. When you fall prey to various trials and oppositions against your trust in God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Following? So he says, you know, I want you to count it relational joy, relational excitement. Get excited when you are opposed in your trust. When you set towards trusting something God has said and it feels like all of, of, of uh, you know, the whole world comes against you, count it relationally exciting because you're about to go on a journey. Anybody ever been to Walt Disney World or to, to Universal Studios or anything like that? And you get on a ride and they'll start off with something like, you know, you're about to go on a journey or something like that, you know? You know, and kind of gets you excited because you're like, oh, cool. This is going to be a cool ride. Well, you know, this is literally what John, James is saying, you know? You know, yeah, it might be a bumpy ride, but, you know, what you're about to experience with God is going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced before. Strap yourself in. Count it relational excitement. Amen? Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, sure. Is it the enemy that's often doing this? Yes. yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm never, once I came to Christ, I'm never just with the enemy. Amen. He's there while I'm bellied up to God's table. Right? I'm eating in the presence of God, with God in the presence of my enemies. Amen. If the devil's there, God's still there. If the devil's not there, God's still there. So it doesn't matter whether the devil's there or not, God is. Amen? Amen? So yeah, even though I'm experiencing opposition, even though I'm experiencing a trial, that didn't make God go anywhere. Right? And so I'm about to get into a journey, because a journey that the enemy had no desire, had the complete opposite intent. He desired by this trial to stop my trust in God and make me, make me question God's good character, his good name. But the end result is going to actually be, I'm going to trust God greater and know him more by the time it's done because he brought opposition. God turned what the enemy meant for my evil for my good. Amen? Amen. Amen. So count it joy. 
He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you are fall prey to various trials, oppositions against your faith, knowing that this testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience. <clears throat> but let patience have its perfecting work. Uh, this means it's going to take a while. Yeah. Seed, time. Yeah. Time, 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 time. Time, and then eventually harvest. Amen? Uh -huh. So he says here, Knowing that this testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfecting work. In other words, be patient with your patience. Right? Let it take time. Don't be in a hurry. It's about the journey, not the destination. Amen? Because, you know, you'll find that, you know, the destination is really the same thing as the journey. Yes. The one that I'm walking with is the one I'm going to be meeting at the end of the journey. Yes. So I'm communing with him the whole way. To me, I'm always living in the point. I'm never off a point. I'm in the point. I don't, my point is not a destination just in the future. That, that's a destination. That's something that's going to happen. But, but the destination uh, that I'm heading towards is the reason why that's important is because the journey that I have to go on to get there. Otherwise, the destination really has no meaning. Are you following? Just having character change without communion with Christ is pointless. Paul said that. He said, I had a righteousness which was among the law, and it was blameless. But I have come to the point, now that I am born again, that I count all that as rubbish, that I might actually gain Christ rather than just righteousness apart from him. Amen? I can do all these things that are right and have re arrived at a destination, but it's a very lonely destination, and it's not even the point, because righteousness was never the point. Communion and intimate fellowship was. So the journey is what God is about. Are you following? Yeah. This is very important. So he says, So then let patience have its perfecting or maturing work in you, that you may become mature, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. In other words, in this journey, when the enemy attacks you, when the enemy comes against you, if you're lacking the voice that God speaks to you. In other words, in order for me to trust, I have to first hear. And if I'm going to do, I have to first hear. So if you're lacking this, ask of God. Mark. Yes. In, in relation to what you were saying earlier, is that why with the Greeks they would go to what they would call their sages and their philosophers and, and well, um, wise ones or what? Well, in terms of seeking knowledge. It, this isn't why they would do it, but um, because they were doing it. If you're talking about what I'm thinking about, talking about the Greeks and stuff like that, they would do that just because they were curious, idle curiosity, or they wanted to have uh, success in living or to increase their crops or to increase their business. But for us, of course, is I know you already know, you know, is radically different. We do it in order to, because we cannot trust in something God has not spoken to us, right? right? So in our seeking, when we seek wisdom, the enemy, I mean, the, 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 the world, the, gen, the Gentiles, the, the Greeks, when they sought after wisdom, they were seeking at it, after it as something to, to bolster themselves up. And in fact, the scripture talks about that, that knowledge puffs up, doesn't it? In other words, it elevates us in pride. And God isn't for that. But when we seek wisdom, we're not seeking it, of course, to puff ourselves up. Amen? That's never the point. The point is that we might have an encounter with God, hear him, that we might live. What well, was that scripture we said earlier? The quote from the Old Testament? Man shall not what? Live. 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 Live out of bread alone. Natural sustenance is not enough for man. Whether that natural sustenance is food or information or relationships or whatever. Man can't live out of these natural things alone, but by every word that proceeds. So my doing or my living, the course of my life, is set by the words he speaks. Amen? So when we look at this passage here, he says, But let patience have its perfecting work in you, that you may become mature and complete, lacking nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, go to God and ask for it. Right? Yeah. Go to God and ask for it. If you're lacking his voice, now you need to understand, the word wisdom there is the word Sophia. I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself, but no, actually I'm not. Word Sophia, it means deep knowledge, natural and moral insight, learning, science, 
implying, implying cultivation of mind and enlightened understanding. All of that. But you can just really just sum it up with enlightened understanding. Okay? Wisdom, Sophia, is enlightened understanding. In other words, it's revelation knowledge. It's revealed to you. It's rhema. It's God speaking. If any of you lack God speaking, ask him. Now, let's just go ahead and stop here for a moment. In the past, I have talked to you about the fact that, I've already said it today, that, you know, you can't, you can't do what you've not heard. I mean, we even had a slide for it, right? You can't do what you've not heard. Is, is everybody with me or no? Have I lost yeah. anybody? Yeah. You guys are with me, yes? Okay. So you can't do what you haven't heard. Well, wait a minute. What if I know I've got an area of sin in my life, but I haven't heard God? If I haven't heard God, I don't have any trust. I've got nothing to work from. Are you following? So do I just sit and wait till I hear God? No. I'd say the fact that you know that there's an area in your life that is sin is hearing from God. It's That's exactly sin. right. <laughs> exactly right. If you, didn't hear, if you didn't hear from God, you wouldn't know that that was sin to begin with. Absolutely. Uh, that was my point, and I was getting to it. You made it for me. Awesome. Thank you. No, absolutely. Absolutely. The fact that you have enlightenment and recognize that it's wrong is Sophia. It's enlightened understanding. You would not have known it was sin, right? Now, you may not have had a word from God that encourages you or tells you how to trust him out of it. You just know it's wrong. You know what I mean? Does that, does that mean that you just sit on that and wait till God speaks? No, 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 no. No. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask. You know, God expects us to, expects us to be a relationship. Amen? Relation, in relationships, it's not always one person starting the conversation. You know, in, in Terry and I's marriage, she does not just sit away around waiting for me to talk. You know what I mean? She will engage me as well. Amen? It, this is a bi-directional relationship. Amen? If she's got a need, she brings it up. If I've got a need, I bring it up. Are you following? Yes. So, so it is with God. If he has something he wants to see done in your life, he'll often speak. Sometimes he'll just reveal. You'll have an awareness that something's not right. It's an invitation to a conversation. Amen? That obviously is a, one of God's little uh, takeaways for the day. So you might want to write that down. When, whenever you get something like that, a little nugget from God, a little intuition, a little in, insight, a little knowledge, it's an invitation to a conversation. Amen? It's an invitation to a conversation. Do you need to hear God speak to that? Yes, you do, absolutely. But you don't sit back and wait until he speaks. You go seeking him out. Amen? It reminds me of Proverbs chapter 8. If you remember Proverbs chapter 8, in fact, just go ahead and turn there. And keep your finger here in James. We'll probably come back if we have time. But in Proverbs chapter 8. <clears throat> starting in verse 1. And again, this is wisdom. And what do you say if you lack what? Wisdom. wisdom, ask of God. In other words, if you're lacking revelation, if you're lacking a word from God, ask of God. Well, that's kind of common sense, isn't it? It's cloaked in, in, in Bible speak. But it's really, that's all he's saying is, if you haven't heard from God, go ask him. It's very practical advice, isn't it? Yeah. Right? It'd be like, you know, well, I, I say I work at Sam's and, and Stephen is my immediate manager. And I'm complaining in the break room that, you know, well, Stephen's not told me what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to sit on the, uh, on the forklift or I'm going to sit there in, in receiving and, and wait until he says something. And they're going to look at me like I have two heads and say, you know, if he hasn't spoken to you, maybe the guy's busy. Go ask him. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Ask. Get off your rear end and ask the guy. If, if I need to hear from him, I already know who I'm needing to hear from. Well, then the next step is go ask. <laughs> you know? If you haven't heard from God, maybe the reason is because he's trying to evoke you to take action. Mm -hmm. Amen? I mean, let's, I know I keep on going a little side journeys, but God brings them to me, so I'm sure they're there in order for you to really grab this truth. Remember when we were talking about intercessory prayer? It's not that God did not realize that the end game was going to be that Abraham and Moses were going to intercede on behalf of the people. God was fully aware that was going to happen. With Moses, <coughs> God was telling him the truth. If I go out with these people like things are right now, I will kill them. 
That's all there is to it. They will die. And so, you know, I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit back here and I'm going to send my, send my angel with you and he will go before you and he will take you to the promised land. But I'm not going to go because if I do, I'm going to kill you all. I'm not touching it. I'm not doing it. And now, was he telling a lie in order to get Moses to do something? No, he was telling the truth. If under those conditions God had gone, they would have been annihilated. But what was God trying to do? He was trying to evoke out of Moses a response. Now, couldn't God have just said, now Moses, at this point, this is what I need you to say. God, I'm going to intercede for them. But God was not looking for a robot reaction from Moses. He was trying to stir him from the heart. Now, if Moses takes action and intercedes, it's something that owns Moses rather than just something he's doing to obey and pacify God. Are you following? It owns his heart. God, what does the Bible say? It says God molds each one of our hearts individually. Could God just come and say, Moses, now my part is to come tell you I'm going to kill everybody if you don't intercede. So I need you now. I'm going to shut up and let you start interceding. Go. You know what I'm saying? Could he have done that? Sure he could have done that. But then, then Moses' relationship with God would have been very religious and very mechanical. What God did was reveal, this is my heart. I love these people. I don't want to destroy them. But because of who I am, if I go under these conditions, I will have to kill them. Period. What did that do? It stirred in Moses' heart. Did God know it was going to stir him? Yeah, God's kind of smart that way. He knew. Right? And what happened to Moses? He was stirred to say, you know what, God? You said you were going to bring these people up. Unless all of the surrounding nations say it was because you were, were unable... I'm asking you, Father, to pardon their sin and be the merciful God that you just revealed to me on the mountain that you are. And I'm asking you to show that mercy to them. Amen? Amen. And it pleased God. Amen? <laughs> I want that whole pleasing God bit. Amen? Yeah. And in order to get there, I need to hear his voice. Amen? So God will often do things. God's not always going to come right out and say, Now, Stephanie, I want you to do this. Sometimes he'll just bait you. So that you'll come and you'll ask and enter into the conversation to let it own your heart. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in, in Proverbs chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, Does not wisdom cry out, and understanding lift up her voice? Well, if she wasn't, you would never have known it was sin in the first place, like Stephen just said a minute ago. Right? That is wisdom. That is understanding. We don't know how blind we are outside of God. Right? He says, she takes her stand on the top of the high hill, beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entrance of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I cry. My, I call. My voice is to the sons of men. O you simple, naive ones, understand prudence. And you fools or silly, stupid ones, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things. And from the opening of my lips will come forth right things. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who possesses understanding. And right to those who find knowledge. Receive my instructions. Hear the word receive. It's part of the verse we're going to be reading in James. Receive my instruction. See, you can hear it all day long, but if you're not receiving, it doesn't do any good, does it? Right. He says, receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things you may desire can't even be compared with her. Now skip on down to verse um, 32. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain it. Blessed. We, we read that in the book of James, too, don't we? Yeah. Who, who's the blessing attached to? Those who do and don't just hear, right? This will be blessed in what he does, does right? Yeah. Here it says, blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life, 
Now, that's a stark contrast from what we see in 8.1. In 8.1, wisdom is out there crying to get our attention. But he says, you know what, you would be blessed if I didn't have to try to get your attention, but you were seeking after mine. Amen? Amen. This is what James is also saying. We don't, we don't just wait for God to come to us. If you're lacking wisdom, go to Him. Ask. Blessed is the one who's waiting at His door. Don't wait for God to come chase you down. Amen? Isn't it true? You know, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 11, I think it is, uh, David said, um, actually, you know, now I forgot exactly what it was he said. Uh, <laughs> I had the passage, the reference, but, but I forgot what he said. Uh, 119, verse 11, he says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right? Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against Now, as best I can tell from looking those words up, they're a little ambiguous, but I think the word there is actually talking about the written Torah, not God's spoken voice. I've taken what I have, what I do know. I know the Bible says do not steal. Right? So if I'm a kleptomaniac, that might be an important verse for me. Right? Yeah. Maybe. Right? So I now know what's right. Don't do it. Okay, well, I'm going to hide that word. Now, at this point, I've heard nothing from God that enables me to live what I know. I just know it's wrong. Amen? So what am I going to do? I'm going to ask God for wisdom. Speak to me, Father. And in between the time that I ask and the time that he answers... Is there something I can do? Yes. Be faithful with what you have. What do I have? A verse that says, stop it. Right? So what do I do? I hide that stop it in my heart. Right? Yes. I hide it there. I treasure it. I say as I'm going through the way, you know, Father, I know that it's your desire that I stop that. And it's my desire that I stop that. And I'm thanking you that you're speaking into my heart, enabling me with power from above to stop that. And I'm worshiping you. And I'm turning it over and over in my heart. God, I thank you that I'm going to, I'm, I'm beginning to see that you're speaking to me. And I'm beginning to see stealing the way you see it. And I'm going to learn to hate it like you hate it. Amen. This is the way I do it. Are you following? Have I got wisdom yet? No. But what am I doing? I'm being faithful over what I have. And what does God promise about that? You'll receive more. You'll get more. If you're faithful over what you have, more will be given. But what we do is we hear, don't. And it makes us cower. And it makes us think, oh, I don't want to do it again. But you know what? I have every confidence I do. I will because I always screw up. And, you know, and then we go in this battle in our head. And before we know it, we're doing it again. And we're like, God, I'm sorry again. God never intended us to live that way. That's called defeat. God expects us to live in victory and overcoming, which is faith. Right? Mm -hmm. They overcame him by the blood of the testimony, the, uh, so the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, and not loving their life to the death. Also in the book of 1 John, it also tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our trust in him. Not our trying harder. Right? Mm -hmm. So what do I do? If I don't have God's spoken voice, I ask for wisdom. Speak to me, Father. And in the meantime, I'm going to meditate on what I have. Even if all I have is a statement that says, stop it, right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's enough, isn't it? Yes. You know, um, in uh, Psalm 49, that's another good one, before we turn back to James. In Psalm 49, it actually says this, and it's been a, 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 a good verse for me ever since I first read it. Wonderful, wonderful verse. Psalm uh, 49 Starting uh, verse 1 through, I think, I don't know, we'll, we'll, I don't know when we get there. Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world, both low and high, both rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom. wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall bring understanding, bring enlightenment, right? I will incline my ear to a proverb. What's a proverb? It's a wise saying that's written in essentially riddle form. In other words, I don't get it yet. It's still a proverb to me, right? But I'm going to incline my ear to a proverb, and I'm going to disclose a dark saying on the heart. What was that? Now, that was David's thing. It's not my thing. 
But you know, David's thing was he'd sit there and he'd sing about it. He'd play a harp and he'd sing about this proverb. Mm -hmm. Something that was a dark saying to him. He had no understanding. He didn't get it. Mm -hmm. But the meditation of his heart would bring him the understanding. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's being faithful over what he had. That's right. That's all he had. But you know, you see how God's wanting to engage you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you see how we are. And can you see this is why the enemy loves to get us to hide in stuff and things and events and to be busy, busy, busy? Uh -huh. You see why he likes to do that? Uh -huh. Because it keeps your attention away from being in the conversation with God. Well, you know, I dealt with that. I prayed. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be anxious for nothing. And by and to do that, I'm gonna get busy doing this and get my mind off of it. No, 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 no. Now see, you're missing the point. No, no, no. I can have my, I can have my mind. I can have that fully in my, 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 my sights the entire time and still not worry. Because in the presence of my enemy, I'm still eating at the table. See, my attention is towards God. Are you following? Is everybody yes. following me? Does this make sense to you? Okay. So he says he's going to disclose a dark saying on the heart. The meditation of his heart will bring him the understanding. It'll do the exact same thing for you. Turn back to James. We're going to have to close up here pretty soon. In James chapter 1, he says, If anyone, verse 5, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all freely, liberally, and without reproach, and it will be given to him. It will be, will be, everybody say will be. Will be. Given to him. Given him. Right? Yes. Now, you, right there is where you can first start trusting God. Did he not say, if you ask, it will be given? Yeah. Well, then you need to trust that. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. How many times have you gone, I'm not asking for a real answer, but how many times have you gone to God asking for wisdom, really, really not so certain you're going to get it? Yeah. You know what I mean? <clears throat> well, God, he says, that's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. So he tells us, he says, you know, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask trusting. Trust that God's good for his word, that he's going to do it, right? Yeah. Let him ask in faith with no. How much? Yeah, no. no doubting, right? Because he who doubts like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Don't let that man suppose he's going to get anything from the Lord. It doesn't mean he won't, but don't presume that he will. Yeah. Right? I've gotten wisdom from God many times when I well know for darn well I was not in faith. God was just being good to me. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Can I get a yeah. witness? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you know, but at the same time he says, you know, if you don't trust, don't presume that you're going to. Right. You may not. In fact, you've got a good chance you won't. But you might. But I, I don't want to play the numbers racket. I want to just trust and know for a fact I'm gonna get wisdom. Amen. Yes. He says let not that man suppose he receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man and unstable in all of his ways. My stability is found in God's voice. What he says, it's the rock that I build my house upon rather than the sand in Jesus' analogy, right? And when the winds do come and beat against both houses, the only one standing is one that was built on the words of God, what he spoke to you. Amen? Yes. So very, very true. Mark? Yes. That is a wonderful uh, scripture to evangelize the lost mm -hmm. because when they ask, they'll get wisdom, and that's Jesus. That's right. That's right. And the Holy Spirit will give them uh, give them uh, yeah. the Holy Spirit will give them the ability to trust God's going to speak to them. Yes. So in fact, a lot of sinners will automatically believe that because the Spirit of God's already been doing His work. Yeah. Verse nine: Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. And the rich in his humiliation. Now, what is he doing at this point? He's setting the stage for the kind of environment in which you can receive wisdom, hearing from God. Amen? In other words, he's saying, don't let externals define you. Right? If you're lowly, what is the typical thing in the world to feel about yourself? Down. Bad. Bad. Right? He says, he says you know, let the lowly brother exalt Right? <clears throat> Amen, yes? yes? Amen. He says, a lovely, lowly brother, glory in his exaltation. God is exalting me. Amen? Let the rich in his humiliation and being brought low. Because as the flower of the field, he will, pay to, he will fade away. Right? So the rich needs to be mindful of the fact that, you know what? 
I have riches today. I may not have them tomorrow. I want to glorify God with everything I have today while I have them. Amen? And the lowly brother like, you know what? It doesn't matter whether I'm lowly or whether I, I'm increasing in riches. God's exalting me. Yes. See, I'm not, I'm not defined by my current conditions, whether it's a good one or a bad one. Right. I'm finding my identity in him. Amen? And what he, in his work in me, right? Yes. Well, can you see how that would set us up for hearing God's voice? Oh, yes. Because remember, as we'll read later on, we'll probably won't read later on today, but when we, later on, much later on when we read it, the scripture tells us very clearly that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, humble, humble. Yeah. right? Part of humility is not allowing yourself to be defined by externals, but be defined by your creator. For no sooner has the sun risen with its burning heat than it withers the grass and the flower fails and the beautiful appearance perishes, so will the wise man fade away in his own pursuits. But blessed, we're going to see that word kind of frequently, blessed is the man who endures through this opposition, through this temptation. This word temptation is the exact same Greek word as the word trial earlier. Same word. Okay? Blessed is the man who endures the temptation. For when he has been proved, right? When he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life. What's being tested? My faith. But what's being proved? I am. Yeah. Right? With, and because trust comes out of a good heart. Amen? So I, I'm being proved, but it's my trust that's being tested. Right? Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of knowing God. He'll be, he, he, in other words, he will be honored with knowing God more. You've been faithful over what you had, right? Which the Lord has promised to those who truly love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I've been tempted by God, because God can't be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt anyone. But, let e but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and then enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift is coming actually from God. Yeah. See, the reason why you're falling into temptation is because you're believing a good gift is coming from somewhere else. But don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Your flesh is going to lie to you. <laughs> Yes. Your flesh is over and over again. Your flesh is going to lie to you. Oh, life is found over here. If you just do this, you'll find life. No, you won't. Lying so and so. Don't be deceived, beloved. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Comes down from the Father of light. It does come down, doesn't it? It comes down. It doesn't fail to come down. It always comes down. From the Father of lights, within whom there's no variation, not even a chance of being any different. Of God's own will, remember this. It wasn't your will. You're not, you're not what made you born again. It was God's will. You, like Stephen said earlier, making reference to the whole sin thing, you wouldn't know God hadn't told you. You would never have known Christ was the Lord if he hadn't revealed it to you. That was not your will. That was God's will that revealed that to you. Amen? Amen. Of his own will he brought you forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's the first time James brings up the point of his letter. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his, of his creatures. In other words, Christ in you. Christ in you. Amen? The reason why God called you, the reason why he invited you, was to glorify Christ in you by you becoming like him. Amen? Amen. Don't be deceived. Other roads are going to lead to some other image. And they're not life and they're not good. They're lying to you. Don't be deceived. Every good gift is coming from the Father. Yes. And the good gift is Christ in you. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Therefore, my beloved brethren, I'm going to try to get to this first and then we'll just close. We have to shut it down because we're already kind of late. Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. You can't do what you have not heard. heard. So be quick to hear. You know, this is as much a, a statement about don't be pig-headed as it is anything else. Yes. Don't be, what was the biggest problem Israel had? They were stiff-necked. They were like dragging donkeys through the wilderness with their hooves dug into the ground. God had a good land to bring them, and they were resisting his goodness all the way. Right? Yes. Don't be like that. 
In the psalm, David says that. A thousand years into the promised land, David in wisdom said, Don't be like the horse or like the mule who have no understanding, who have to be harnessed with bit and bridle or else they won't come near. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. He says, Therefore, beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and certainly slow to wrath. Because the wrath of man doesn't produce the goal. What's the goal? Christ in you. Right? The righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside. Now, the word lay aside is an interesting word. It essentially means renounce. It doesn't mean by the power of your effort, stop. It means renounce it. It's a heart decision. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Make the determination I'm not doing this anymore. You're not saying how you're going to do it. You're not doing anything yet. You've just become resolute right. about something. It's like Jesus, he set his face towards Jerusalem. Right? right? Amen? Are you following? Yeah. Uh, or actually, Paul did that. But Jesus, Jesus set his, uh, his face resolute actually for the cross. To die. Amen? Yeah. He made that decision. He was resolute about it. Well, this is essentially what this means. Okay? When he says there... <clears throat> Um, therefore, lay aside, be resolute about laying aside, about setting aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. He's bringing it up again there. It's another way of saying Christ in you, right? Save your soul. Let's look at the couple words here. He says, lay aside, which means to renounce something. He says, receive. So you're laying aside and you're receiving. Lay aside and receive. You need to know the next verse is the one that talks about be doers and not hearers. So this, is, this verse leading into that one it is telling you how to do it. You can't become a doer and not just a hearer if you have not laid aside and if you do not receive. Are you following? You can't. He says, I'm telling you, renounce filthiness and wickedness and receive with meekness the word meekness it's another word that is talking about being resolute again it means resolute gentleness with strong determination i'll read that again meekness is resolute gentleness with strong determination in other words be pliable and be determined to stay that way. Receive with a pliable heart. A heart that's so pliable that it's dedicating to stay pliable. Are you following? Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The next thing that it tells us is the word implanted. What it is essentially saying is you have to have the kind of heart that is compatible with what's being placed inside of it. The King James uses a much better word that says the engrafted word. Mm. You cannot graft things that are genetically incompatible into one another. It will be rejected. The plant will have an immune reaction. Amen? Yeah. Well, you know, it's sad to say that many, many Christian hearts have an immune reaction to the Word. Mm. And we need to not have that kind of heart. How do I not have that kind of heart? Well, he already told us. What I do is I um, renounce filthiness and wickedness, and I receive what I receive with gentle determinedness. Right? Determined to bow the knee and receive what I'm told. Amen? Are you following? Does that make sense to you guys? This is the reason why I'm taking a little bit of time with this part is because this is the crux. It's more important than the doing part because you'll never get to doing if you don't do this. All right? This is very, very important. He says, I want you to renounce these other things and be determined to have a soft, receptive heart to God that receives a word that is like him. It's compatible. Amen. It's engrafted into you. Amen. The grafted word of God, which is able to produce Christ likeness in you. Save your soul. Amen. We'll pick up there next week. 
in talking about that. We haven't even gotten to the verse yet. But um, are you begin to see some of these things that are... The, I hope that you... First off, I'm actually teaching like three lessons here. One is... The first and most important one is that we can't do without hearing. You can't do without hearing. Number two is we need to pay attention to how we hear. If the Word of God tells us something, we need to read what it says, who said it, who they're saying it to, so that we understand the context, so that we don't build roadblocks up to keep us from hearing God's voice when it comes. Are you following? And the last thing here is that we need to be um, determined. Determined to renounce the evil and submit to the good word when we hear it. No. Amen? Absolutely. And I guess actually there's one more, and that is if you're lacking wisdom, ask for it. Ask for it. Whatever you know, whatever you've heard is an invitation to a conversation. Have the conversation. Every time that we read about David or hear about Moses or hear about Abraham, the wonderful successes, Sarah and, and Rahab the harlot and all the various other ones uh, that, that heard from God, Esther and Ruth and, and, and uh, um, uh, Samuel and, and you know, all the wonderful, wonderful examples we have from Scripture of men and women who, who lived by faith and obtained a great testimony, a good report, right? What did they do? They didn't sit back and wait for God to talk to them. They entered into the conversation. They had the conversation. We cannot take a word that was spoken to them, rub it on our problem, a problem and expect the same result they got because that's not what they did. The reason why you had a verse to read is because they heard from God. Amen? Do what they did. Don't just read what they heard. Amen? Relationship with God. That's right. Relationship. Relationship.